Well, the few, the brave, the crazies, I don't know what to call you guys, but you guys braved the weather tonight, and I'm thankful because honestly, I thought it was going to be me and Ron in the sound booth and Pastor Brett just having church by ourselves, so thank you guys for coming out. Um, Just out of curiosity, how many were rooting for the Chiefs this afternoon? All right, that's pretty good. How many are hoping that the Packers beat the 49ers? Any 49ers fans in here? No, go 49ers? No, kind of, whatever. Go Niners. I'm kind of hoping for a Midwest uh, Super Bowl. I think that would be kind of fun. Oh, what's that? No, that, that don't even know that, that there were games today. Yeah, well, I, uh, we can just take a moment. We'll pray for everybody at home watching the Packers game instead of being at church. You know, I'm just teasing. Well, I'm glad that you guys are here tonight. And tonight we're going to be uh, starting a series titled Tough Questions. In the next several weeks, we're going to be answering some of life's difficult questions that get thrown at us. Things such as how the church should respond to gender identity or how could a loving God send anyone to hell. And tonight we are going to be addressing probably the biggest and most asked question of all time. If there is an all-powerful God, and if that God is all-loving, then why is there so much suffering, pain, and evil in the world? How many have ever asked that question? Right? I know I have. This question is thrown at us by people who might not want to believe in God. They might not want to confess with their mouth that there is a God and so they throw this question saying well evil the existence of evil is why I don't believe in God and so in order for them um, to to really I believe is everything I'm still here all right and and excuse me um, is what's going on here is that is it my microphone do I need to grab a uh, handheld would that be better? All right, take two. So, um, in order to answer this question to someone, um, I, I believe oftentimes we try to answer a question to an unbeliever uh, that's posing this question, and we, we quote a whole bunch of scripture at them, which is... An okay thing to do. However, if the person that you are having a conversation with doesn't believe in God nor his word, then the Bible really isn't a great place to start at with having this conversation. So tonight I'm going to take a unique approach at answering this question without using any scripture. Now before uh, anybody pulls out some stones and said, you're having a sermon without scripture, Hopefully, as you answer this question, if you have this dialogue with whoever's asking this question, whether it's a, a, a sibling or a child or um, a neighbor or a coworker, um, hopefully, as the conversation goes on, it will then open up their eyes where you can share scripture. So at the end, I'll give you a couple of scriptures um, that you can share with them. George Barna conducted a national survey in 1999 in which he asked a cross-section of adults in America, if you could ask God one question and you knew he would give you the answer, what would you ask? And the number one answer to that question is, why is there pain and suffering in the world? This is an age-old question. 1,600 years ago, St. Augustine, anybody ever heard of him, once asked, if there is no God... Why is there so much good? But if there is a God, then why is there so much evil? 2,600 years ago, the prophet Habakkuk asked a similar question. And you can see on the screens, Habakkuk 1, verses 2 through 4. How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked him in the righteous so that justice is perverted. Does that not sound like where we're at today in society? It's as if the prophet Habakkuk was actually writing for right here and right now. And so 
when someone comes to you this question and sounds like Habakkuk, it sounds like St. Augustine, that sounds like maybe yourself, and you're sitting here asking this question, um, you want to respond to this in a two-step process, um, asking two questions. And, and, um, and the first one is this. You ask the individual asking this question, why is there so much pain, evil, and suffering? We ask the question, where does most pain and suffering come from? Where, what, what inflicts the most amount of pain, suffering, and, and, and evil? And the answer always is people. Example one, anybody ever heard of Bashar al-Assad? Right? Syria's dictator is responsible for killing thousands of civilians and is, and is oppressive to anyone who gets in his way. More than 82% of Syrians are living below the poverty line, and he keeps the money and the resources for himself and his posse while the rest of the country suffers. He is a horribly wicked man and is causing all sorts of pain and suffering. This is a prime example of a person inflicting these things. Example number two, names such as Dylan Roof or Stephen Paddock, or Patrick Crucius. Does anybody recognize those names? People are looking at me like, come on, I know there's some Fox Newsers out there that, <laughs> that are watching. Dylan Roof shot up the church in Charleston, uh, South Carolina, and killed nine people. Stephen Paddock was the Las Vegas shooter, killing over 50 at, at, at the country concert in Las Vegas. And Patrick Crucius killed another 22 people this past year in a Walmart in El Paso. This is another example of a person inflicting pain and suffering men among other people. Exa example number three. Imagine a man cheats on his wife. They end up getting a divorce. The wife is upset, hurt, angry, and many other things. These, the kids that are involved in, in this affair, they're hurt, they're confused. They're questioning so many different things at this time, all because of this man's mistake, all because of this man's decision. You see, in that situation, that it's an individual who is causing pain and suffering to many, many people involved. Example four, imagine a girl who transfers schools. This, this girl is super nice, she's smart, she's great at singing, she excels at most extracurricular activities that she does, but the other girls her age get jealous and they start to spread nasty rumors about her. And pretty soon nobody wants to be her friend because of these lies that have been told. The, this pain and suffering came directly from other girls. Now I understand that all of these are hypothetical, but they're all very much real, and we see these on a day, daily basis. So hopefully at this point, the person that you're talking with will agree that most of the world's pain and suffering is caused by humans. Everybody on track. Everybody agree with that. This is not to answer the question of where does all pain and suffering come from, but where does most? So the second question you ask them, have you ever caused someone pain and to suffer? And the answer is, if they're being honest, is yes. You could go back and think to a time, maybe even this week, where you said something or you did something or responded to your children or your spouse and you caused hurt or pain or suffering. In all of us lies the potential to either do good or to do evil. Your lust could lead you to a moment of regret and cause someone deep hurt. Your anger could lead to a weak moment where you kill someone. Your jealousy could lead to a moment where you smear someone, which could lead to that person committing suicide. Your selfishness could lead to you not helping someone in need, and that person would suffer because you were unwilling to help. Let me ask you, and don't raise your hands. But did anybody pass someone stranded on the side of the road today in this bitter cold thinking it's too cold to help? We all have the potential of evil inside of us. And so that brings us to this. If God were to get rid of all of the evil in the world so that there would be no more pain or suffering, then he would have to get rid 
of you and he would have to get rid of me. We all have caused someone pain and suffering. And even if we haven't, the potential of evil lives inside of us and it's only a matter of time before we do. And so this is a conclusion that we draw from these two questions is that if God is really real, then he must be a loving God because if he wasn't, then he would annihilate all of us because of our evil tendencies. Do you see how that question contradicts itself? They try to use this question to say that God is not all-powerful all and saying, well, he, he's obviously not getting rid of all the evil. I mean, if he's all-powerful, he would just snap his finger and that would be done. Well, this question doesn't prove that or disprove that God's power. The claim that God is not loving is disproved by this question. It, it's actually a proof that God loves us because he is merciful to us and he's bringing us along in this process of restoring creation to what it was in, originally intended. The claim that there is no God because of the existence of evil isn't a valid argument or thought process. Hopefully things are starting to connect for the person that you're talking with. And after you ask those two questions and draw that conclusion, your friend or your foe, um, who you are talking with might ask this question. Well, if God knew that people were going to screw things up and cause so much evil, then why would he create us in the first place? Sounds like a pretty cruel God if he's all-knowing. Why would he even create us? Have any, has anyone ever asked that question before? I have. And it's a great question, and it all comes down to love. Studies show that five out of ten couples end in divorce. Why do people even still marry today? Well, why, why do they get married? Don't they know that they'll, they'll most likely end in a nasty divorce? Don't they know that in marriage there will be pain and suffering? The answer is people still get married in hopes that they will know and experience love. Love, a free will choice to show affection towards someone or something and or to receive affection from someone. A free will choice. This is the definition to show affection towards someone or something and or to receive affection from someone. As soon as you remove the choice or the free will, then it isn't love. Why would a married couple choose to have a kid when they know that there will be pain and suffering involved in parenthood? Again, the answer is the opportunity and potential of love. God created love and knows how rewarding it can be. And I argue that there is no greater love to experience than a love that is undeserving. Meaning you have done nothing to deserve that love and affection. It's easy to feel love when you feel as if someone owes you that love. But when it comes from someone as a random act of kindness, how many know that that is often the most moving act? It's completely undeserved. And our gift of freedom that God has given us to choose love also makes possible the absolute horror of evil. If there was no opportunity to choose to, to love, to do good or be kind, then those actions would be meaningless. So the conclusion is that God saw the possibility of true, unconditional, undeserving love was worth pain and suffering but if you eliminate free will then you eliminate love now hopefully at this point the person realizes that one that their original claim or question is not and cannot be verified as true and two that in order for there to be love and good in the world there has to be a contrast of free will now once you've successfully had this conversation you will now be able to share with them the gospel that God didn't create us without a plan to save us from our suffering and our pain. That, that he sent his son Jesus to come and bring healing and restoration. 1 John 3.8 says, the reason why the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Share with them that someday God promises to return and to take us to a place that has no more pain or suffering or tears, or death. Share Romans 8, 28, which says, for we know that, that God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Share that when we draw close to God, he calls us to change and to love our enemies. He calls us to feed the hungry and to clothe 
the widows and the orphans. See, I think sometimes people get so fixed on, on why is there pain and evil and suffering and, and they don't even, they ask that question without really the intent of digging how do you even become a part of the solution. See, God's plan to eradicate evil is to have everyone in a relationship with Him. This is where the conversation really turns. When they, when they realize that, that God really is loving and letting us live because we've all caused someone hurt and pain, but God is wanting to draw us into Him so that He can change our hearts so that we can be the answer to evil, that we can be the antidote to pain and suffering, that we can provide those things to the people that are hurt and broken. God doesn't ignore the evil in the world. He asks us to be part of the solution for all the evil in the world. I think that's pretty cool. I think that's pretty special. If everyone gave, if everyone served, if everyone loved, if everyone forgave, if everyone remained pure and within the, the boundaries of marriage, if, if everyone was secure in who God made them to be, if everyone obeyed God, there's no doubt that the pain and suffering in this world would significantly subside. He calls you and he calls me to be a part of that. And once we're on board, then we receive another mission to go grab other people and be fishers of men so that they too can be an antidote to the pain and suffering. I hope that this has been beneficial for you. And I hope that this is just one more tool in your tool belt so that when you are presented with this intimidating question, that you can answer it in a deductive manner and not just quote scripture at someone who doesn't even value scripture. You need to be able to, to, to walk them through this thought process of, of you know, their, their question. So I know that this was pretty short, but I intended on being short because how long can you talk about a question like this? Um, but I do have four questions, and I want to spend about five minutes where we are just taking a look and allowing God's Spirit to speak to us in these four questions, and you can throw them up on the screen. And I want you to ask yourself as we sit here and as some soft music begins to play, is there anything that I'm doing that's causing pain and suffering? And I believe that for some of you, you might know just in an instant, like, yes, I'm, I'm being a stinker to a guy at work, or I'm, I'm just, you know, causing someone just extreme pain and suffering in this moment. And you might be able to identify it, but I believe that sometimes the greatest offense is that that is unintentional. You think of Jesus dying on the cross and he says, forgive them for they know not what they do. I wonder how much pain and suffering you have caused and I have caused when we don't even, we're not even aware of it. You, you know what brings light to those situations? The Spirit of God. And so in just a minute, we're going to spin and we're going to ask God to reveal that, to illuminate areas in our life, things that we have spoken poison that we have spoken, whatever it might be to illuminate it so that we might be able to do something about it. Have I done something in the past that needs to be made right? Sometimes that requires just taking a bite of humble pie. How is God directing me to eradicate evil, pain, and suffering in the world? We're all in this together, we're, we're, don't make me do the song and dance. <laughs> but we are, we are all called to a broken and hurting world. It'd be a shame, just as James says, if we saw a need as the body of church, uh, of the body of Christ, as the church, Jesus' bride, and we saw a need, and we did like what James wrote. Stay warm, I wish you well, but you don't give the coat. I wonder what we are doing, what God might be calling us. Maybe he's asking you to give even more sacrificially to missions. Maybe he's going to lay someone on your heart that is just in such a season of pain and suffering that, that God is calling you to do something about it. 
Listen, don't come to me identifying needs. If God has illuminated a need to you, maybe you're the answer to that need. If God lays that person on your heart, oh, you know, Austin, I was just kind of thinking that someone should do this. Well, maybe you should buy the groceries. And finally, and most important, who can I pray for that they would be saved? Because without salvation, we live this life without the hope and the assurance of being returned to heaven, being caught up in heaven, where there's no more pain, there's no more sickness, there's no more suffering, there's no more sorrows. And the greatest gift that we can receive is salvation. And when God enters our heart, he gives us strength. I once heard a sermon from a guy that had chronic back pain. He's actually a, a pastor. He was a pastor at James River Church. His name is Scotty Gibbons. He's now at the People's Church under T.D. Jakes. And he has chronic back pain. And so much so that when he goes on an airplane, he can't even lift his carry-on luggage up over into the thing. And so his wife or his daughter, and, and he's got all these people looking at him like, how are you not lifting that up? And people don't even know what he's gone through. And he said these powerful words at, at camp this past year. He said, sometimes God answers our prayers of healing, not necessarily with healing. And I shared this with someone just this week. But he answers them with the ability to endure. And so your healing is actually found in the presence of God in your life so that you might be able to endure what you're going through. I want to give that to people. I want to give the power of Jesus to people so that they might be able to endure the pain and the suffering that they're going through. So Jesus, as we close tonight, I pray that you would speak to us. Use these questions. Illuminate areas in our heart that we're blind to. Open up our ears. Open up our hearts, God. I pray that we wouldn't use this information to be mean and, and cruel, but it would be in a restorative tool, God, that, that when we share these questions, that when we take people on this logical journey, this deductive way of thinking journey, that it would be all for the purpose of restoration. So allow us to see just a little bit more, to have a little bit more clarity tonight of what you're calling us to and how you're calling us in this great mission that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take the next four or five minutes. God, I pray that as you've spoken to our hearts, that we would have wisdom and how to respond, that you would equip us with your Holy Spirit. It brings a power to be your witness. It does not give us a spirit of fear, but of courage and boldness. I pray that this church would not just attend church, but we would be the church. That we wouldn't just raise awareness about needs, but we would meet needs. We wouldn't just talk about fishing for men, but we would go out to the highways and to the byways. Bringing anyone and everyone that wants to hear to the table. In Jesus' name. I want to leave you uh, with just two thoughts. First thought, that same speaker, I went back on my 
my notes from that sermon, and he said that your pain will never kill your commitment to God. It will only reveal it. I think that's a very powerful statement. Your pain will never kill your commitment to God. It will only reveal it. And so whether you're in the midst of pain right now or you're in the, the good season where things are, are, are all right, where do you stand with God? Are you committed? And the second thing is that you might never receive the healing or you might never receive the freedom, but what if your anchor and testimony of steadfast faith in God paved a way for your children and grandchildren to follow God all of their days? How do you respond in the midst of pain and suffering? Because that's a testimony in and of itself. So, God, I thank you for everyone here. I pray that we would we would take this knowledge, that it would be sealed in our hearts and our memories, and that you would lead us to someone who needs you. And you would equip your saints to do that work by your Holy Spirit in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.